Uh, welcome. We're looking forward to the class. Yes, um, he's hoping that I'll learn enough to finish his tunic. So TikTok was actually finally good for something. So uh, <laughs> I found our teacher's page and oh, you know, tracked her down. I did so not know that. I did. It was pretty nice. Yeah. So uh, the... you're going to have to follow her TikTok page. I believe you'll have to send me one of her videos. I will. <laughs> We can give it a minute or two. It looks like in the last two minutes, somebody has joined, but uh, whenever you're ready to go, please introduce yourself and then uh, we'll go from there. Awesome. So we'll do the intro first because that'll give us a nice little time to get people in. My name is Tasha Medvedeva. Please call me Tasha. I am from the kingdom of the East. It is 8.03 here. I know it's just like late afternoon for you guys out on the West Coast. I live in the barony of Carolingia in the Canton of the Towers, which is the northeastern part of Massachusetts. I am a Laurel, and I've been elevated for all of three months. My specialty is women's Viking garb and hand sewing. So yeah, my, my like bliss is um, hand sewing. And I started doing it for a very easy reason, one of them being... Um, I could not hear my movie over my sewing machine. My sewing machine is incredibly light and I was shoving it across the desk as I was working and it has a very small throat, so I couldn't fit very much through it. So all in all, I don't like using my sewing machine. You see, hand, hand sewing is slower, but I have a lot more control. And I also find that um, I don't seam rip nearly as much when I'm actually holding the seam and making things go. So there's that. For this class, um, there was a link to my handout on basic hand sewing techniques. Um, so please feel free to download that, learn it, live it, love it. So now you can see the scarred tabletop right there. First things first, I thought I would go through my sewing kit and do like a little everyday carry for hand sewing. The so first thing I have in the box is, these are called wonder clips. They're just these little, almost like bulldog clips. You can get them at Joanne, but you can also get them on Amazon for like a hundred of them for $10 in a cute little care, a little, cute little tin. They're great for just holding your seams together. They were designed for um, quilters to hold their, uh, those edge bindings on because they're smaller and easier to handle than bulldog clips. I also keep my thimble in there. This is not a period thimble by any stretch. This is a plastic and rubber thimble from Dritz, but it fits well and it's comfortable. So that's what I wear. I also do use pins, particularly for like things that are on the inside of the fabric, not on the seam edge. I use these dressmaker pins that I got from, you can see that. Uh, I got them from Wawak. Um, anyway, so Wawak does, it's like tailoring supplies. There we go. Beautiful. So it's tailoring supplies, dry cleaner supplies, and they sell things like those dressmaker pins. I also got some uh, basting thread. This is, um, this is just like a, a, a heavy, stiff cotton thread. It glides through the fabric and it pulls out really easy, easily and it's very easy to break. So if you manage to sew through, see, basting thread. I label everything. If you need to sew, if you end up sewing through your basting thread, you can break it and not interrupt your stitches. Usually carry three or four different colors of silk thread. This is all made by Gutermans. This is readily available at Joanne or joanne.com. I, I carry white, black, gray, and then, you know, a couple of, actual colors red blue green i can do pretty much anything i need to do with white black and a couple shades of gray so those are in there this was not in the bag but this is this is a scrap from a project and this is where i keep some pins and needles it's just handy and that way when i reach in i don't poke myself because ow i'm delicate i am a fair fragile flower this is a seam uh, hem gauge you set this little slider to however deep you want the hem. This goes up inside the fold and you can just measure how deep your hem is. Super handy, not, not expensive, love to have it. 
one thing that I have discovered is that I am a, I'm a needle snob as well as being a bit of a, a fabric snob. I like John James needles. I like tulip needles, which I think I have some over here maybe. I like Boheen, um, Richard Hemming and Son, um, S. Thomas and Sons. All of these are needles that I have purchased because Abby Cox kind of told me to. If you follow Abby Cox on, on YouTube, she did a video about uh, leveling up your hand sewing. One of the things she talked about was using a thimble and using good quality needles. I realized that the Dritz needles that I was using were kind of dragging through the fabric. These, any of these are fantastic. I actually, these are milliner's needles. They're super long, but they, they're basically a sharp, but like really long. They have a tiny eye. I can stack so many stitches on this when I'm doing a running stitch. Might not be for everybody. It's not great for all applications, but it works for me. Don't know what happened to the tulip needles, but anyway, um, I have purchased these on Etsy. I've purchased them on Amazon, you can find them if you really, uh, I think I got some from Burnley and Trowbridge as well, who are fantastic. Not only do they carry some really good stuff, even though they cater to 18th century, a lot of the stuff is still good for our period, but they're super duper nice. Really good qual um, quality customer service and their goods are really, really awesome. And then I carry a pair of embroidery snips I use these for cutting just about everything, both thread and fabric. Um, I will often pull a thread and we'll talk about that later on linen and I can just snip, snip, snip. It takes time, but it's precise and I like it. And then this little gem is a six inch quilters ruler. You can see through it. It's got markings both horizontally and vertically. And I don't know what I did without it. My sister is a quilter and she's been hiding this stuff from me. Don't get it. It's rude. We had to, we had to talk about it. We're good. Um, and also a piece of Taylor's chalk. This is yellow. I also have it in red, white, and blue. And uh, this is fantastic. The rubs, the yellow is a little, stains just a little bit, but the white and blue comes pretty much, comes pretty much right out. Um, you can sharpen it with a pair of scissors, just sort of running the scissors over the edge. I got it on Amazon. I want another set of Bohemian needles. So that's about it. That's what I carry in my kit on the regular. So the first thing I want to talk about is assembly stitches. So there we go. Piece of scrap linen from a banner that I just made. And we're going to do a running stitch on this. Oftentimes what I will do is I will take that little ruler and mark a line. Oops, sorry about that. Oh, I had another one. Okay. This is a friction pen, F-R-I-X-I-O-N. It's made by Pilot and I got it at Target. What I'll do is I'll take it and put it right along the edge here. You know, um, so these are quarter inch markings. Let's see if we can get that a little bit. There we go. Let me zoom in. It doesn't let me zoom in. Okay. So these are quarter inch markings. I'll usually do like three eighths. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, these are quarter inch markings, the yellow ones. Oops, if I turn it around. The yellow ones are, are quarter inch. These are one eighth, the black ones. So I usually do like three to five eighths. So I'll do a five eighths inch seam allowance right now. The friction pen turns white when you iron over it. Everybody says, oh, it disappears. It does not disappear. It turns white. Um, but that's still pretty cool. Works fine on white fabrics, less so on darker fabrics. But you can use that to your advantage because you can also, um, 
make your line on a dark fabric and then iron it and then you have a white line. You just have to be really careful of where you do it and make sure that you're not um, doing it where it's gonna show because once you iron them, they will come back if it gets cold enough. So that's happened when there's been a bunch of people who like took notes for grad school on with a friction pen. And then they put it in their car in Texas and left it there in the sun. And all of their notes disappeared because they got too hot. Put it back in the freezer for about half an hour and it will all come back. So that's a handy little tip. However, it can also come back if you don't want it to. So do be, do be careful with that. All right, so I'm gonna just thread up some, I'm gonna move, I gotta move this up. I'm sorry, I keep hitting it. Okay, so I'm gonna thread a needle with a contrasting thread just so you can see it. This is a sharp, so it's got a very tiny eye and it's actually pretty flexible. I know people that bend the crap out of their needles. I do not. I am much more gentle on my stuff as a rule. This is called a tailor's knot or a kissing knot. Um, I've never been one to make that wrap it around your finger and roll it off. I've never been able to make that work properly. So this is my favorite. So you just pinch it between the, the thread between the needle and your finger, wrap it around on top, pinch it, and pull the needle through. And because I'm doubling it, I just stick my finger in the loop to make sure all of the, um, everything ends up even. I do have this on one of my TikToks, <laughs> a recent one, in fact. So I, I like to put my thimble on my third finger. Your mileage may vary. There is no one true way. Um, I don't care what Abby Cox and Bernadette Banner say. They all, they advocate putting it on your second finger, but I push with my third finger. So that's what I'm gonna protect. Running stitch is very basic. It's just strictly in and out. So sometimes I'll pull it all the way through. Sometimes I won't. What I generally do is I'll do one stitch at a time, but I don't pull it all the way through until I've got like three or four stitches going. Um, I'm using the silk both because it was what I had to hand and because it glides through the fabric really easily. If I use polyester or linen, I do rub it with some beeswax. I don't feel it's necessary with silk, but that is your basic running stitch. If you, once you get used to it, you can be pretty even with how long your stitches are. And you can stack them like so and pull it through and you have made several stitches. However, as you can see, that will, that's, you can use that for a gathering stitch. And also if this thread breaks, your whole seam is gonna come apart. There's a couple of ways you can combat this. You can do what's called a running back stitch where you like, you do, Couple hand stitches, boom, boom. And then you do one back stitch. And then you do a couple more running stitches. So when you do the back stitch, you're just sort of literally going back and looping around. And that back stitch will lend a little bit of, a little bit more support and a little bit more strength to your seam. If you wanna go whole hog and make it really secure, you do what you do a, a full back stitch. This one, you can only do one at a time because you're actually, you actually may pierce the threads going the other way, but you, you do a stitch, right? Like that, that's a running stitch. And then you just keep going back over and out just past where your thread's coming out. Once you get the hang of it, it goes pretty quickly. This is great for seams that are under stress. 
something in a bodice, especially say a self-supporting bodice. Running stitch is perfectly fine for say skirt seams, things that aren't under stress. But definitely you want um, something stronger when it's going to be under tension. So there's that. Are there any questions, comments? All right, I, I'm going to assume that everybody is fascinated, enthralled, ready to do it. Yeah, awesome. That's great. So I'm just gonna cut that because I'm going to move ahead. Oh, wait, first, before I do that, I'm gonna show you how I finish, finish off my thread. Sometimes I will just stitch back the other way, but a lot of times what I'll do is I'll make a stitch, leave a loop, put my needle through the loop. And I'll do that a couple of times like that. That makes a little knot in the stitch. And then I just cut the end. Sometimes I'll bury it in the seam. Oh, come on. I need these scissors sharpened. Sometimes I'll bury the end in the seam if I have it available. Sometimes I don't. So we have a rudimentary little seam here. That's what the back looks like, pretty straight, pretty neat. So what you can do, the cool thing about linen, linen crease, well, cool and bad, it creases like crazy. Um, you, can, you can crease it with your fingers or I have a couple of these glass slickers. I have this one, which is just a lump. And over here, I know it's over here, under things. I have this one. These were both made by um, a guy who goes, who his company name is Historic Glassworks. Um, in the East, he is often known as Arab Boy. He goes to Penzik. Um, he has his, his glass blowing set up at Penzik and does demos and makes things there but he, he made me a glass slicker and I love it. And all you have to do is rub it on the fabric and it helps crease it. Oh my goodness, I am so sorry. Helps to crease it, makes it look good. This one is, is heavier. It actually is a little bit easier to use in terms of making that crease. Also, it just fits really nice in the palm. And I handed it to a friend of mine and he was just sort of weighing it. And he was like, I looked at him and I said, you kind of want to throw it at someone, don't you? And he goes, yeah, I kind of do. We didn't throw it at anybody. It was too expensive for me to do that. All right, so we've opened up the seam. Then as now, pressing your seams is important. And what I'm going to do is just cut off about half of the seam allowance. Now, one thing you can do if you're so inclined, you don't have to do this. You can offset it and just not make the edges even when you when you go to sew it. I am not that I'm not that person. So once I've opened it, now I have to sort of close it again and I rub it with the slicker again. And then you fold this raw edge over into that fold like so, rub it again. And you don't have to use a glass slicker. You can use your fingernail or, you know, you could be crazy and use a steam iron. Um, but my steam iron is over there and I'm over here. So we're gonna use our fingers and heavy things. I mean, you could, if, if you have a, like a glass lump sort of uh, paperweight, have that, that'll work too. Be creative. All right, I don't have enough thread here, so I'm gonna re-thread my needle. Let's try some red this time. I like red. Oops. Show you that knot again. Be 
just sort of, I don't know if it'll focus. Wrap it around, pinch it, pull it through. I stick my finger in just to make sure that the loops are even. And there's that. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to use what's called a felling stitch or an overcast stitch or a whip stitch to fasten this edge down. That way it will encase all of the raw edges and your fabric will not fray while you wear it. Learn from my fail. I have a dress that, has, that is patched on the seams because I didn't do this. I tried to fix it later and I didn't have enough seam allowance left to turn it. So I just covered it with a strip of fabric on the inside, you'll never know. One of the things that I encountered though, when I started hand sewing all of my, all of my garb was that once you get like up into the middle of a skirt, you end up with this ginormous wad of fabric in your hands and it was driving me crazy. I thought back to when my apprentice sister taught me how to do a blind hem on a sewing machine, which I still can't really do very well, but she's amazing. Um, and she folded the fabric like this, right? And I was like, well, if I fold the fabric like this, so these folded edges are together, I don't have to have wads of fabric in my hand. And I can still whip stitch, whip stitch this edge. You just have to go through just the very edges because you just need to hold it. This is not a load bearing stitch. You just need to hold the edges. And with the silk, sometimes you can load a couple stitches. Usually I end up having to do these one by one. But this is genius. Just I just have to, this is genius. <laughs> and his excellency's sleeves will now be done. I'll mute us again. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so the first time I taught this though, there was a Laurel in the room and she wasn't even taking the class. She was just sitting there because she had the classroom next. She was like, I might as well just hang here. And we're actually very good friends. And this was well before I got elevated. Um, she, she had the same look on her face that you did. <laughs> She's like, wait a minute. It's because it's revolutionary, especially with sleeves where it's getting narrower and narrower and you're trying to shove like, like half your arm up. The, yes, mm -hmm. that is genius. Yep. I, <laughs> I, I just literally cannot be bothered with gathering a ton of stitches, a ton of fabric in my hand. It's uncomfortable. It ruin, it messes up the fabric. The sweat, the sweaty palms will set the, the creases in the <laughs> fabric and yeah, gross. So yeah, I can do like two stitches before I pull it through. Um, just because things like that happen and I make little knots. I've gotten very good at pulling out tiny knots in silk thread. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay. There we go. All right, so I'll just pause here. And this is what it looks like on the outside. So if you have matching thread, it is well nigh invisible. On the inside, it looks like that. Um, I do have a friend, she does hers the other way where she does a straight stitch on the edge. On, um, she does it so that underneath, she has a slanted stitch on the right side. Um, and a straight stitch on the inside, I do it the other way around. Personal preference, I think she does it that way. She's in, um, an expert on the Langberg find, you know, the, um, the German bra they found in the castle. Um, and I think that's how they do it in the extant examples. But I don't even have that much as a Viking specialist. So yeah. But that's what it looks like on the outside however you want to do it.
There is no one true way. And all of this can be done with a sewing machine. You just run your stitch along here, you do the same fold, and then you just run a top stitch right along the edge of this seam, almost like a tiny little running stitch, just right along the edge. Um, I do not do my flat fells this way just because they, they don't, I don't think they look as good. I don't, I can't get the evenness. I don't care enough to practice to get the evenness that I want, but you can do it. Like I said, everything can be done with a sewing machine. And also then you're sewing through three layers of fabric with a needle and well, that's that. That is, um, they sometimes call this a run and fell stitch. You may see it mentioned that way in some of, some of the um, documentation or whatever. I just call it a flat filled seam. This is, this is actually a seam that you might see on your jeans where they would roll it because 12, which is what jeans are made of, likes to, um, it likes to fray and do weird things and it stretches in odd directions. And this is a very sturdy, non-stretchy, um, non-stretchy seam. I use it on all of my linen because again, like you, as pretty much everybody knows um linen likes to fray when you look at it so does a lot of silks what i will do with silk is i will run um glue stick right along the edge and that it's washable so it will come out eventually but it will let you sew without racing against time to find out whether or not you're going to have any fabric left by the time you get to the end All right, next up. That's base, those are the basic stitches I use for most assembly. We can talk about how I work with wool. This is a piece of wool from a dress that I made. I'll cut a little strip off. Oh, one thing that I, I didn't address is um, thread choice. I talked about needles. I didn't talk about thread. I do use silk a lot because I like it and Guterman makes it very accessible. However, it's not always the best choice, say for wool. For wool, I, I generally use um, a wool blend. This is, just tip that up a little bit. This is Madeira Bermelana. Is that what it is, Bermelana? So this is 50-50 wool and acrylic. It is made for machine embroidery, but it works great for sewing for the SCA. It's a little bit easier on wool fibers than silk. Um, it's $11 or $12 for a thousand meters. It's not expensive. It's no more than 13. I know it's gone up a little bit in the past year. Um, and they are in Laconia, New Hampshire. So being that I live in Massachusetts, I actually went up there and picked mine up. They do charge more if they have to UPS it to a residence than to an office. So if you do wanna order from them, which I highly recommend, they're super, super nice. Um, if you can have it sent to an office, it'll be a little bit cheaper on your shipping. So. Get off of it. That needle. This needle. So for wool thread, I do need a slightly. Where did the thread go? There it is. I do need a slightly bigger eye. So I'm not sure if you can see that. That has a um, like a an oval shaped eye instead of the round eye that the other one does. So what I do is I fold it over the needle, pinch it tight, pull the needle out. And instead of trying to get the end through, which could fray and make you crazy, I try to I wiggle it right through the eye, the folded edge right through the eye. Sometimes it works better than others. There we go. And it's through. My grandmother taught me how to do that when I was like six, except we used thicker yarn and one of those big needles that you let your children play with, but yeah. 
My grandmother was awesome. I'm going to do the same same here. Now, with the silk thread, doubling it is kind of optional. I have found that doubling the thread with this wool thread is not optional because as you pull it through, it will wear and it will wear very badly in the eye of the needle. Wow, that is crooked. Wow. Let me see if I can make this a little bit more even. I want to hem this and show you how the hem stitch is done. It's very, very similar to the overcast stitch. As a matter of fact, it kind of is the overcast stitch that I did. And bearing in mind, folks, I'm left-handed. Reverse all of this if you're right-handed. I'm just going to pin that so it holds. I would normally press this and press it with, with heat as opposed to using the slicker because wool has memory and the slicker um, doesn't reform the fibers the way that heat and steam will. If you don't have or don't want to put water in your iron, you can just spray it, spray the fabric with water and let that form the steam. Again, we just pop through and just make a small vertical stitch on showing on the outside and a slanted stitch on the inside. Um, if you do this, you know, finely enough, it shouldn't show very much on the right side if you're using matching thread. I am obviously using non-matching thread so y'all can see it. So there you go. That's what that looks like. Now there is another stitch that is period and that everybody likes to use on their Viking garb on the outside on the seams as decoration called the herringbone stitch. This one, I actually start at the other end. As a lefty, I like to move my needle from left to right. If I start at the other end, this will be very awkward. So take a stitch there. And then we go down below the fold, right below the fold, take another stitch. And then we go back up, take a stitch. And this, this second stitch actually doesn't have to be through the outside of the fabric. It can just be this, the folded over part. Stitch. So, and there you can see the herringbone forming. So I'm not entirely sure why the world thinks that you need to decorate every freaking seam that you have on your Viking garb because we have absolutely no evidence for that. What we have evidence for as far as a decorated seam is a cushion that was found in a grave in Mammon, Denmark. That's it. Um, the other decorated seam, there was a false dart not a false dart, but sort of a dart taken in the um, fragment that was found in Hedeby Harbor, you know, covered in tar and shoved into the in between the boards of the ship. Um, and that was covered with a six strand braid, but it was not this. This is used to hold down your seam allowance. I've used this on my elevation dress because I was running out of minutes and I needed to fasten down the seam allowances. So that's what I did because it was quick, it was easy. And honestly, you can do this across a seam. So we'll just tie this off, just take another tiny stitch. And then I'll show you how I make the, the seam on this. So normally what I will do with wool is I will fasten the seam allowances down first and then I will sew the seam itself and do the construction. What I'll do is fold it right sides together.
and just whip stitch it. I use whip stitch a lot. Now for this, you'll probably want it to be pretty close together. I started off and I made these big wide stitches and that ends up being extremely flexible and your seam will gap and put a lot of strain on your, cause I was using this on a bodice seam on my apron dress and uh, the six strand braid what it says was the six strand braid done as a separate piece tacked over the seam or was it somehow worked onto the seam itself as far as we know it was couched down on top of the um on top of the seam and it's not really a seam it's a dart it was a, a tuck that they took you know to tailor the the dress that's the theory and it is it is just a theory because um well, you don't have a complete apron dress. We've got images um, from Goldgubber and uh, little the little Valkyrie figurines. And we have, um, you know, runestone carvings, stuff like that. We don't have a complete dress. It's extremely frustrating. All of our Viking garb is best guess sort of things. Um, the fragments of textiles that we do have that are not covered with tar are from graves and we're in contact with metal because the metal keeps the um, textiles from rotting. So I did, you know, a fairly close um, overcast stitch. This is what it looks on the outside. And it's not as flexible. If I had done a wider stitch, it would be obviously more flexible, like right here where the stitches are slightly farther apart. You can you can kind of see through it. I don't know if you can if you can tell, but it's not that bad. Um, the our garb is or my garb is not terribly fitted, so this works fine for me. So let's talk about. Because I think this is a nice little transition flat felling and um not flat felling sorry flat lining and um assembling your garb all at the same time just need to get a couple pieces of linen I'm just gonna crease that edge as we talked about just using my fingers. So these are our lining pieces, right? These are the outer fabrics for the purposes of this exercise. What we wanna do is take the fold of the lining fabric and put it facing the outer fabric on this side and we'll do the same thing on the other side. And we want all of these edges to line up. Sorry, I didn't, I could see it, couldn't you? <laughs> all right, so we have a sandwich and it goes lining, outer, outer lining and the folded pieces are facing each other, right? This is where these, these little clips come in handy because this is thick with two C's. And this just helps keep everything in place like so. More fiddling like so, see, look, clip. Promise to a clip. I'm going to use the silk again because there's enough of it and I already have the needle threaded.
So what we're going to do is we're going to start, we're going to skip right over this outer lining bit. We're going to go through both of the outer layers and through the closest, the lining closest to you. Then we're going to do that again. We're going to skip the lining closest to you. And we're going to go through the two outer layers and the lining layer. And again, skip the lining, go through the two outers, go through the lining. I learned this from a Burnley and Trowbridge video on YouTube. Now, again, they specialize in 18th century. I do not. But this same, and I was lamenting that on Facebook, and my friends pointed out that this seam shows up in the Viborg shirt, which is a linen shirt found at Viborg, Sweden. Um, it is almost complete. It was found in the bottom of a post hole. It has the weirdest, most entertaining seams. It, it goes to get, yeah. It's got a square neckline. The front, the, the body of it is, is um, lined. And it has a square neckline. And where the slits are, it like overlaps so that it's warmer for you and you can open it and close it however you, you know, however much you want. The lining is, and the outer fabric of the body are sort of quilted together. Um, it looks like seams that, there's a square in the middle and then seams going from every corner, each corner from the, sh to the shoulders and then down to the hips. Those are not seams. Those are like tiny little tucks. I thought they were seams forever. I thought they were seams until I got a book on how the, the shirt was constructed. It was so much fun to put together and so weird but so clever. And I will be teaching a class on that in February at my local novice Scola. Probably a little bit advanced, but what the heck, people go for all sorts of reasons, so. All right, I've done a few stitches here. They're a little less visible because red and blue do not contrast well. I'm a herald, I should know. Um, but we'll stop right there and we're gonna open this up and show you what it looks like on the inside. So that's what it looks like on top. You can see it's almost sort of a baseball stitch. This is what it looks like on the inside. If I had used um, if I had used thread that matched the outer fabric, you would not see it. That's what it looks like on the inside. Neat, tidy, flat, flat um, lined. This thing is magic. I was so excited when I discovered it. I made a hood with it. I've made a coat with it that literally it took me a week hand sewing to make a fully lined wool um, Kloppenrock, which is the men's wrap coat from Burka. So um, yeah. So right now we've got two different um, joining stitches, two different hem stitches and a method of flat lining your, your garment and assembling it all at once. I absolutely love this. Um, does anybody have any questions? Because I think I've covered quite a lot and I'm not sure if anybody's brain is going to be full yet or if you want me to keep nattering on, what do we got? We always have as much time as you want to teach. You know, okay. Even if everybody log, else logs off, we will keep going. <laughs> Especially um, when we're learning things like totally awesome new seam treatments. Excellent. I'm glad you like that. I um, do. <laughs> I was not quite prepared to do necklines tonight. Talking about necklines, they seem to be the bane of everybody's existence. If you want to do just a regular faced neckline, the secret is don't cut it until you've sewn your facing down. Because if you cut before you sew the facing, that neckline, because it's a curve, 
it's going to skew and you're going to be fighting with it and there will be words you didn't know you knew none of which is a bad thing because i personally i love to swear but i also love getting my project done so if you sew it down before you um before you stitch it i'm sorry before you cut it it stays in place it's all one piece then you cut it flip it top stitch it um turn the edges whatever um and you're done what you can do is either if you want a hidden facing sew the facing to the out to the right side of the garment if you want a contrasting facing or facing that shows sew it to the inside of the garment when you flip it, it'll come out i don't use facings very much anymore because they are not particularly period for viking what i do do i will either bind the neckline and you don't have to use bias tape for this. Or I will just roll the neckline. And oh, that's something I could show you how to do is a rolled rolled hem. So let me grab another piece of fabric. We'll do a rolled hem. So both the English stitch and the rolled hem, there are TikToks that I made for those. And I've done done a few different sewing tutorials. It's super fun. It's so much easier than YouTube. Holy shamoli. You got to have all the different editing skills to do to do YouTube. And I don't need all that in the way of editing skills to do um, to do TikTok. All right, I'm gonna jump back in here. Let's get some white going here. So this rolled hem is ridiculously easy all right so we're just going to take a tiny stitch here and the tip of my all right, I'm going to suffer and sew without a symbol. And we just sort of angle up and go through. So basically, we're going to do almost like a herringbone stitch. Tiny stitch here, angle up right to the edge. Come on. There we go. And you just sort of keep folding the hem over and stitching as you go. You only want to take a couple of stitch, couple of threads at a time. Again, this is an edge. This is not meant to be load bearing. This is fantastic for veils. Um, I use it on necklines, sometimes on on um, cuffs. I would not use it. Somebody on my TikTok commented, oh, I'm going to use this on the, to hem a pair of pants. I would not use that for pants. I would want something a little sturdier, a little wider for a pair of pants so that they hang right. But like I said, this is great for necklines and veils. So once you've got, you know, I've got like five stitches done like that. This is where the magic happens. You just pull it and it rolls itself. I have heard this called, I can't, Enya's magic veil stitch, I think. I forget who's, it had somebody's name attached to it, but I have learned this from several people, including a good friend of mine who helped me build my tent when I needed help. Um, because she ran the industrial serger for me that I was convinced was going to take off my thumbs. So she has my eternal gratitude for that because that thing scared the daylights out of me. Again, you just pull it. And you know, give it, give it a little assistance with your fingers because I mean, you probably wouldn't be using the medium weight linen from fabricstore.com, which is what this is, because that's a little bit thick. But I don't know, maybe you would. You do you. 
And then every now and again, I would take another little tiny stitch like through the edge here again, because again, that's just like a running stitch and it might come undone on you. So if you just take a couple tiny little stitches, um, and again, just finish it off the way I showed you with the little knot. And then you can bury the end inside the, the seam or the hem, just like that. Just make sure that the needle goes on either side. You know, it doesn't come through on either side so the, the, the thread doesn't show. And then put it off close. There you go, mold hem. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. <laughs> I take it you wouldn't want to go much beyond like five stitches before you pulled it tight. Um, I have gone quite far before I pulled it tight. It depends on your thread whether or not it's going to glide through. Um, one thing I didn't really cover is where the heck did it go? Oh, I did have a block of had a block of beeswax in there. I don't know what happened to it. Um, you probably want to like put um, run beeswax over your thread to give it a little slip. It also helps condition the thread so it doesn't break as easily. So yeah, that is a rolled hem. That works fantastic for necklines. It works great for veils, like I said, um, like maybe the edge of a coif, stuff like that. Um, how else do I do necklines? One thing I have seen done on necklines, do I have that one here? Yes, I do. Hold that thought. I'm just going to go grab one of my undergowns. So this is an edge that I bound with a piece of silk. So I, I sewed the silk right to the edge of the fabric, and then I rolled it over the edge, turned it under, and stitched it down. Right, And then I did these running stitches around the edge for decoration, make it look pretty, and um, because this is what was done in period. This is a straight grain piece of fabric. You don't need to use bias if it's narrow enough. This is an excellent use for selvage that you cut off of your fabric. So this is nice and narrow. It's, you already own it. And one edge is finished. You don't have to turn it. So you put the raw edge on, stitch it down, flip it over. It will make a tiny little seam right here. And then you just stitch this down and you're done. It's so easy and such a, I mean, some of these selvages can be fuzzy and you just trim off the fuzzies and you, you have a clean selvage edge that you nest, might not want showing like on a cuff or a hem, but you can use this. You can also use, this is actually marked up as a bara tape, but you can use twill tape. I've done that too. Um, here, I used twill tape on the, the edge of this fabric when I was um, building this banner. This was stuff that I had to trim off. What else have I used? You can use ribbon. Basically anything that's narrow, I wouldn't go more than half an inch because once you go too wide, then it's going to want to pucker on the edge that's being stretched around the outside of the corner. If it's narrow enough, it kind of, it doesn't want to do that. It works so good. I had no idea. And people who, when I tell people that I, I hem my necklines on the straight grain, they're like, what, what did you, what? How does that work? It's like, you don't have to clip curves if they're narrow. You don't have to, um, use bias tape if it's narrow. If it's wide, yeah, you're gonna run into problems. And most modern um, pattern makers use a very wide seam allowance compared to what's done. Yeah, cup covers for the rolled hem, that would be really good. Sorry, I got distracted. Um, modern manufacturers use ginormous seam allowances wider than what was used in period. Do not, this is, this is just me. Please don't use the simplicity 
medieval garments, there is an old pattern for a sideless surcoat that uses 12 freaking yards of fabric. 12. <laughs> 12. That is not necessary because they cut it as a circle instead of doing gores. Because I guess they were making Was that easy. pattern published by a fabric company. Simplicity. I just figured that somebody might have a financial stake in selling 12 yards of fabric. Right. There's some kind of a kickback going on there, I'm I'm certain. But what it was, was they basically picked the most inefficient cut that would give you the swoopy effect and make you not have to do too many, um, too many seams. You can get it. I, from a construction standpoint, I get it. From somebody who wants to make that out of wool? No, no, I don't think so. I have a quick question. Bring it. So back to the, the silk neckline thing, because mm -hmm. I stumbled on that on my own <clears throat> and I've made mistakes. So <laughs> when, <laughs> when you're sewing, the right side and the right side together uh -huh. how how are you doing that are you doing a whip stitch are you doing a running stitch are you so doing when i when i first attached it like when it was yeah. raw edges mm -hmm. i sewed it on the inside so okay was, that's what i mean yes yep, yep. running Sorry. stitch this running is not stitch. load bearing i just need it attached oh okay excellent um I use running stitch for things that just need to be joined together that aren't going, this gets no tension when I'm wearing it at all. It's just a neckline. I just okay. need it covered so it doesn't fray. And this happened to be pretty. This was actually a Yule, a Yule outfit from 2016, I think. <laughs> and I just came back from that event yesterday. So awesome. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I just anything that just needs to be contained, you know, attached to each other is generally a running stitch. Even the flat felt stuff, because that does double duty. Also, like I said, I don't wear super fitted things. I don't do gothic fitted gowns where I need to support on in all of that. That would get backstitched possibly twice. But yeah, backstitch. Uh, running stitch just whatever straight stitch suits your fancy um you can play with it but running okay. stitch is quick and fast and uses less thread yes and then for the the decorative stitches uh is the running stitch that i i yep. just happened to be finishing an under tunic for his excellency um yep. and and i was eyeing the neckline and not panicking but becoming slightly concerned um so <laughs> Yeah, um, I, you can do just, this is just um, silk sewing thread, Uh huh. I think. Might, oh, it might be linen. I don't remember. Everything else was sewn with linen. So this is actually, okay. this is the dress that is used for the examples in my handout. I think where I have the, the example of how the, uh, how the armpit was done everything joining in because mm -hmm. i mean gosh that's pretty <laughs> i have to i have to say that i um 100 share your love of the sewing things by hand because you have more control and it looks prettier <laughs> it hangs better it lasts it longer and you really do get that medieval moment so everybody has their thing in the SCA that they want to embody. Have you ever seen the, um, I think it was Leighton. Uh, it's one of those uh, pre-Raphaelite paintings called Stitching the Standard of the woman sitting on the battlement sewing a banner. <laughs> That's my medieval fantasy. I don't know why but that's mine. So here we are. Clovis, we must wage war with the East so that she might sit upon the, the battlements stitching a standard. Yes. 
<laughs> we used to have battlements. The East, the East Kingdom gates at Penzik was, we had towers, but that broke. So we don't have that anymore. It's very sad. I'm sorry. I did not sit. I did not sit on those battlements stitching anything. I did, <laughs> however, bomb a party with water balloons, or somebody who looked just like me, but it had to be an alien. It wasn't me. Couldn't possibly be me and the Queen of the East and my my Laurel, who is also a Duchess. It wasn't us. Nope. I would never. I'm I'm far too delicate and ladylike. You were assisting with their yearly bath. Sure. Yes. Actually, it was really funny because there was a young man over there who who got his brand new boots splashed, and he came he came across to remonstrate with the people who were flinging um, water balloons, and he discovered who it was, and he was like, "Crap." <laughs> If you ever need a rationalization, like our barony is really good with coming up with side stories and, you know. Alibis? Yes, yes, exactly. Don't need any cookies from this barony. So I would absolutely love to meet anybody from your barony who comes out to Penzik. That would be fantastic. Cause I think the likelihood of me getting to the Pacific Northwest anytime soon is pretty slim. Okay. But you never know. <laughs> Are you taking the only time, time? I, the only ever time I've ever been to Ontario, I was on my two-week drill for um, the Army Reserve mm -hmm. at uh, can't remember the name of the base, but I can see Fort McKinley from the PX. <laughs> Except I get Denali now. Uh, yes, it is. Mount, yeah. yeah, Denali. The, yep. The well, if you ever do want to visit yeah. Ontario, we can put you up. That's, uh, that's no, it's in Alaska. Awesome. Yes. See, this is what I love about the SCA. That's I can so send, I can send a message, and I can find a crash. It's fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah. does anybody, uh, does anybody have any questions? Did I, did I confuse anybody any more than they might already have been, or did I make things clearer? The light of understanding dawned across our minds in ways that we had not <laughs> hitherto anticipated. Wow. <laughs> you guys give good good speech. <laughs> Pretty words. <That's> <laughs> okay, I, can, I have questions that I can ask. Absolutely. <laughs> it sounds like most of these techniques that you've been describing seem mm -hmm. to be Norse related. Yes. However, Running stitch is a running stitch is a running stitch and has been since time immemorial. So you will find that all the way down. Back stitch, all the way down. Whip stitch, all the way down. I, I was so, thinking more of that neat stitch you use to do seams that have linings. Okay. Um, that actually kind of disappears, at least, I'm not sure about the middle of our period, like high medieval. I know it is not seen in the Tudor period because my best friend is Tudor and he has not run across it. He um he does flatline everything. He just doesn't do it like that. But like I said, that is found in the Viborg shirt. And quite frankly, if somebody is looking that closely at the inside of your seams, either you better be in king in your kingdom arts and sciences competition or they owe you dinner. <laughs> or hypothetically they might be your laurel. Well, that too. That too. <coughs> My Laurel actually has not seen the coat I made with that. Um, she moved to South Carolina about a year ago. So, and she never really seemed to check me like that anyway, because I love her. She can drape Elizabethan like that. She can make the skin out in like three days, or at least she used to be able to. She cannot cut an apron dress. She is not a drafts person at all. So I would lay out her apron dresses and cut them for her and then she put them together. It's super funny. Well, I guess my main question is the that lining technique. Mm -hmm. Do we have any documentation of it in the Far East? I have no idea. No idea. Um, I have a couple people I can ask. Is there a particular region that you would be interested in? 
primarily Yuan Dynasty China, but that's when the Mongols ruled China. So oh. Mongols, they go everywhere. Uh huh. I did Mongolian for a hot minute and then I decided I wanted to be able to read the documentation. I you know, have a couple that, people I can ask. That is probably a much more sensible technique than the one I did. Baglining? No. Thinking, I want to read the documentation and buying some dictionaries. Yeah, the problem with Mongolian is that it is written, in, oftentimes written in Cyrillic, but in Mongolian. So you need to, I, I don't think I could handle it. I just, eh. first off, yeah, I got into I, a fight with somebody about it and then I gave up. I am not good with the things that are written in Cyrillic, whether they are Mongolian or Russian. Yep. But I got myself a Chinese to English dictionary. Oh, there you go. That must take a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I don't know if it was seen there because I really don't know how they how they lined things. I wish I did. Anybody else got anything that I can actually answer? <laughs> so do you go, um, do you use just um, basically silk thread for anything but wool? Because I think I was taught that you use thread that matches the fiber content yeah, of your fabric. Um, so that's a that's just a choice on my part you're absolutely right i just first first off my linen thread is buried <laughs> under a bunch of stuff also i find it works best for me if i soak it and use it wet you can also like wax the heck out of it and iron it to let the wax get into the fibers but mostly right now tonight i use silk because it was handy I get my linen thread from a company called Vavstuga. They're a Swedish weaving company in Massachusetts. And I put the I put the um, the link in the in the chat. I use their um, dyed lace weight. I believe it's a sixty weight, but that's a good sturdy good sturdy thread for hand sewing comes in a ton of colors i mean if you really want to be strict about it just use the natural and the heck with making it match it will probably if you do it right it will probably sort of disappear into your fabric anyway unless you're using something very dark um if you're and again if you're that into making it look period don't be sewing on black because black is really hard to achieve um, without making your fabric brittle. Generally speaking, what you have to do is add iron to whatever dye bath, and that will make your fabric brittle. So unless they had, you know, like a Jacob sheep or something where they actually do grow black wool, it just doesn't really occur naturally. Is the black Welsh mountain sheep a period breed? I don't know. I think those ones so. are black all over. Yeah. Yeah, but they weren't everywhere. But obviously they they're are, Welsh. I, I think they're I think they are um I think they are period. I know that there is a primitive breed on the Isle of Man, the Manx Lochtan, L-O-A-G-H-T-A-N, and they're brown. And that is absolutely delightful to spin. I made some thread out of it. Um, it comes in different shades of brown, but they're one of the ones that have like four horns and look terrifying, but they're still super cute. <laughs> um, I did do a, an investigation onto what were permanent breeds and what weren't, but that was over a year ago. So I've kind of tucked that into an inaccessible part of my brain. And you asked where in the East I'm from. I'm from Massachusetts. So I'm in central region in the barony of Carolingia. I'm also Central Region Deputy Seneschal, Central Region Combat Archery Marshal. Um, oh, and I'm Deputy Head Retainer for our heirs, Prince Ry uh, Ryukajin of the Iron Skies and Princess Sandrakshi. Okay, I then so we have another question. How do you have time to actually do any ANS in there? 
because most of what I have to do doesn't require much time. Like CA Marshall, I get to do a couple times a year and Deputy Seneschal is stuff that I can do on a computer, like here and there during the day. I don't know how much time the, uh, the uh, deputy head retainer thing is gonna take up because Ryu and Indrakshi have never been king and queen before. So they're going to be figuring things out as they go along. And those of us who have retained before are going to be giving them some guidance and also, I have no life. Also, hand sewing, sewing is more transportable than machine sewing. Totally. Absolutely. 100%. I carry projects with me everywhere. Um, sometimes it's sewing, sometimes it's not. But not going to lie, I did take my the banner that I made to work because I could lay it out on the conference table and see what was what. Um, also there's good lighting there and, you know, I didn't have to pay for the heat, so I just stuck around after work. <laughs> so we were talking about the sheep and the fiber. What kind of fiber prep do you prefer? I mean, do you spin in the grease? Um, I don't, mostly because I don't have the space to have fleeces and do the processing myself. I confess I use commercially prepared roving. Um, I bought the, Lanx, the Manx Lockton fiber from a seller on Etsy, and it came in a roving. So, You know, if you move to Ontier, we've got a lot of space around here. <laughs> You could keep your fleeces somewhere. That's true. I know. I know. I don't, I think I'd have a hard sell getting my elderly mother to go with me, though. And I would miss my mommy. Less cold. Somewhat better for joints. <laughs> yeah. We're very helpful. Very yeah. helpful. <laughs> very helpful. It's like. We got we got Morgan Donner, so now you're trying to take one of our laurels. Yeah, you took yes, Morgan exactly. You took Morgan. I am. Um, I was finally going to have the opportunity to run into her in an event and be like, "Oh, I recognize you." Come on, you. fair trade. She hasn't been to an event the yet. East owes us. <laughs> She's hiding. So in next month. question: Will you yeah. be teaching a class on spinning? I haven't taught spinning in a long time um i might i could <laughs> okay uh before we devolve too much what? do you have any final words of wisdom I do not and then i will end the recording and we can chat as we okay so first off all of this is just string fabric is string it's string that has been woven together you're using string to make it to make two pieces join together be the boss of your string. Generally speaking, there is nothing that cannot be fixed. Piecing is period. Patches are period. You know, fix your garb. If you think you've screwed it up beyond all recognition, put it down and walk away. Come back, untangle it, look at it, see what you, what you can salvage, see what you want to salvage, because sometimes that's a factor, and move on from there. It's only fabric, it's only thread. Don't let it rule you. Well, what about cases where you barely had enough fabric to make the garment and mm -hmm. then during the pandemic, you put on 15 pounds? 